thing with it. Yeah, I think we're on um Lord Dunmore's war. I can hear you loud and clear. Some situations it wouldn't be right if something won't go on wrong. Check one two one two. All right, I think that fixed it there. If y'all can hear us out there in the chat, press one for me, please. Just making sure we got the audio correct. This rising. It didn't switch over yet. One. All right, we good to go. We good to go. Oh, you can still hear me, TMH? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, okay. 
Just had to add another line in real quick. Grand Rising Copper Indio. Grand Rided, Grand Rising Fitted. New Life CEO Studios. Congratulations on the work over the weekend. And we'll be continuing where we left off uh, last Friday at uh, with the uh, American Indian Wars. And you said the last one, the next one we was going to was Lord Dumas War, Dumas War. It was next on the list. Yep, that is a uh, fact. Um, before we get into all that, I definitely want to uh, send a shout out to Miss Pamela Hall and Miss Danielle Jeffers for the spotlight they did over the weekend. Peace, so peace. Who did not get a chance to check it out, um, please do so. So we were just um, basically showing love to the community and uh, spotlighting those that are out there doing the work, which we will continue to do. And uh, throughout the show, uh, Bones will go over will go over that a little bit more because we're definitely going to need more individuals to spotlight. So. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Bones. And the same with TMH. It was a good, good uh, showing for the first two of many. You know, we're looking forward to finding more people stepping up in the community to let the community know what it is that they're doing. So everyone can see that this is not just talking. This is people actually putting the work in to move forward. And on that note, uh, let's say Lord Dumont's War, Dunmore's War, it's 1774. On one side, we had the Colony of Virginia. The other side, we had the Shawnee and the Mingo. Let's open this up and see. Post this up in the chat if anyone wants it. Uh, here we go. Where's this other one coming from? Community know what it is that they're doing. So everyone can see that this is not just talking, this is people actually putting the work in to move forward. Alright, it's loading up now. Alright, it's a Lord's Dunmar's War. Or Dunmore's War, Dunmore's War, was a 1774 conflict between the colony of Virginia and the Shawnee and Mingo American nations. The governor of Virginia during the conflict was John Maury, 4th Earl of Dunmore. Lord Dunmore, he asked the Virginia House of Burgess to declare a state of war with the hostile Indian nations and ordered up an elite volunteer militia force for the campaign. It states the conflict resulted from escalating violence between British colonists who in accordance with previous treaties were exploring and moving into land south of the Iowa River, modern West Virginia, southwestern Pennsylvania and Kentucky, and American Indians who had treaty rights to hunt there. As a result of successive attacks by Indian hunting and war bands upon the settlers, war was declared pacify the hostile Indian war bands. The war ended soon after Virginia's victory in the Battle of Point Pleasant on October 10, 1774. As a result of this victory, the Indians lost the right to hunt in the area and agreed to recognize the Ohio River as the boundary between Indian lands and the British colonies. Although the Indian National Chieftain signed the treaty, conflict within the Indian nation soon broke out. Some tribesmen felt the treaty sold out their claims and opposed it, and others believed that another war would mean only further losses of territory to the more powerful British colonies. When war broke out between the colonies and the British government in 1776, the war parties of the Indian nations quickly gained power. They mobilized the various Indian nations to attack the colonists during the Revolutionary War. Hmm. So... <laughs> You call that who? <laughs> <laughs> Man, you can't, couldn't you just read? Can't we just read one time? So we can it all happened to go, uh, go horizontal. 
And I'll be shaking my head. I'm like, for real? So y'all fighting the Civil War and Indians again at the same time. Y'all some bad people, huh? Alright, so before we keep <laughs> some background, let's let's go back up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently these the, the, the treaties at this time that were signed allowed Indians that sided with the col- colonies to hunt on these quote unquote newly acquired lands so they had the right to hunt on these lands mm-hmm. which basically means if you was on the losing side you can hunt mm-hmm. on those lands and the chieftains were conflicted because they figured look we lost already lost a lot of land we ain't gonna do it but continue to lose more land so we might as well cut our losses and stop less with these cars out that's what I'm getting does anybody else get anything that's same thing they were like man just forget them we'll do our own thing but apparently not all the Indians felt that way well, at least because we talk about the, the the tribes that were against the um the colonies and the tribes that were for the colonies. Mm-hmm. So the battle ended at Point the Point Pleasant. I think we we'll have to just go back at the top. <laughs> It's a head scratcher. All I'm doing is all I'm all doing is confusing me. So, we're talking about a conflict in 1774 that happened basically two years before the Revolutionary War started. Mm-hmm. And so they say. Right. So we have the Shawnee, and the Shawnee are. I'll go ahead and put this in a, the back chat so you can post it. While I'm reading it, give me a second. Okay, the Shawnee. This article is about the Native American tribe for the use of sea Shawnee. Disambiguation. The Shawnee, or the Shawanwaki, are an Algonquin speaking ethnic group indigenous to North America. In colonial times, they were a semi-migratory Native American nation, primarily inhabiting areas of the Ohio Valley, extending from what became Ohio and Kentucky eastward to West Virginia, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Western Maryland, south to Alabama and South Carolina, and westward to Indiana and Illinois. Pushed west by European American pressure, the Shawnee migrated to Missouri and Kansas in the 1830s. Some were removed from the upper Midwest to Indian Territory, now Oklahoma. So they got so some of them got pushed to Oklahoma too. Mm-hmm. But it's just only some, so there must have been another divide. Oh, this splitting. Of the river. Uh, TMH, they wanted to know if you can uh, speak up a little bit. They said you got kind of low. Okay, I'm going to see if I can turn my headphones up. Give me a second. Okay. I got my headphones turned up as long as they can go. Um, and I'm plugged in to my headphones, so I'm not on my... Um, well, I can fix it on my end, adjust it on my end real quick. Okay. All right. So, um, it says they were pushed by European-American pressure the Shawnee migrated to Missouri and Kentucky in the 1830s. Some were removed from the upper Midwest to Indiana Territory, Indian Territory now Oklahoma, west of the Mississippi River. Other Shawnee did not remove to Oklahoma until after the Civil War. Mm. Made up different historical and kinship groups today. There are three federally recognized Shawnee tribes, all headquartered in Oklahoma. The absentee Shawnee the tribe of Indians of Oklahoma, Eastern Shawnee, tribe of Oklahoma, and Shawnee tribe. Okay. Do you remember hearing about these tribes? 
the NFL be recognized? Okay. Right. <laughs> Appears to be. Right. So that gives us a little bit about the shine. I'm trying to scroll down. So let's go into what they call prehistory. For the information, some scholars believe that the Shawnee are descendants of the people of the pre-contact fourth fort ancient culture of the Ohio region, although this is not universally accepted. Fort ancient culture flourished from 1000 to 1650 CE among a people who predominantly inhabited lands on both sides of the Ohio River in areas of present day southern Ohio, northern Kentucky, and western West Virginia. They were mound builders. Fort ancient culture was once thought to have been an extension of the Mississippian culture, but scholars now believe Fort ancient culture developed independently and was descended from the Hopewell culture, also a mound builder people. Uncertainty surrounds the faith of the Fort ancient people, most likely their society, like the Mississippian culture to the south, was severely disrupted by waves of epidemics from new infectious diseases carried by the first Spanish explorers in the 16th century. After 1525 at Madisonville, the type site, the villages, houses, house sizes became smaller and fewer, with evidence showing that people changed from their previously horticulture centered sedimentary way of life. There is a gap in the archaeological record between the most recent four ancient sites and the older sites of the Shawnee. The later were recorded by European, French, and English archaeologists and was occupying this area at the time of encounter. Scholars generally accept that similarities in material culture and material culture, art, mythology, and Shawnee oral history linking them to four ancient peoples can be used to support the connection from four ancient society and development as a historical uh, Shawnee society. The Shawnee traditionally considered the Lenape or Delaware of the East Coast Mid Atlantic region, who were also Algonquin speaking as their grandfathers. The Algonquin nations of present-day Canada regarded the U.S. Shawnee as their southernmost branch along the East Coast. The Algonquin-speaking tribes were mostly located in coastal areas from Quebec to the Carolinas. Algonquin languages have a, sim have a word similar to the archaic Shawano or Shawanawa, meaning south. However, the stem Sawa does not mean south in Shawnee, but moderate, warm, or weather. I'll see Vogelin. Moderate, warm, CP, Sawani. It is moderating. In, in one Shawnee tale, Sawaj, or Sawaki, is a deity of the south wind. A certain language is Sawaj as it thaws, referring to the warm weather of the south, Soaki is attested as the spirit of the South or the South Wind in the account in one of Viogelin's Vio tales mm. and a song collected by Viogelin. Always learning something Dude, new. This, this rabbit hole gets deep, bro. <laughs> um, <laughs> cause, cause now, I mean, we know that a lot of them come from the you know, Algonquin language speaking uh, tribes. Mm -hmm. um, so this sounds like the um, the um, they stem it from the Algonquin Confederate. Yep, that's I mean. Federation. 
That's what it sounds like to me. I could be wrong, but just saying. Wow. No, I think it's confirmed when I look at what we're on the 17th century. It says Europeans reported it. wide geographic area. One of the earliest mentions of the Shawnee may be at 1614 Dutch map showing some Sawadi. Sawadi located over east of the Delaware River. Later 17th century Dutch sources also placed them in the general location. Accounts by French explorers in the same century usually locate the, uh, the Shawnee along the Ohio River where the French encountered them on forays from Western Canada to the Illinois Illinois country. A Shawnee town might have might have from forty to one hundred bark covered houses similar in construction to the Iroquois long houses. Each village usually had a meeting house or a council house, perhaps sixty to ninety feet long, where public deliberations took place. I guess that goes at uh Theory about the teepees and wigwams again, huh? <laughs> <laughs> According to one English legend, some Shawnees uh, were just descendants from the from a party sent by Chief Api Kanao. Hold on, Api Kanao, ruler of the Powhatan Confederacy. Wow. From 1618 to 1644 to settle in Shenandoah Valley. The party was led by his son, Shawani, Edward Bland, an explorer who, who accompanied Abraham Wood's expedition in 1650, wrote the Apikakanos Day. There had been a falling out between the Shawan chief and the Wiroans of the Powhatans. We Romans of the Powhatans, also a relative of the Opikakoff family. He said that he said the later had murdered the former. Okay, there goes that one. The Shawnee were driven from Kentucky to the in the seventh in the sixteen seventies by the Iroquois of the Peninsula and New York, who claimed the Ohio Valley as hunting ground to supply its fur trade. Okay, so. We in the 1670s, and they 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 heavily in the fur trade. Mm -hmm. The colonists' battles and fallen on the Falam in 1671 reported that the Shawnee were contesting control of the Shenandoah Valley with the uh, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Iroquois. Okay, there they go again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in that year, and we're losing. Sometime before 1670, a group of Shawnee migrated to the Savannah River area. The English, based in Charlestown, South Carolina, were, contact, were contacted by the by the Shoshone in 1674. Okay, so let me read that again. Mm -hmm. Please do. Sometime before 1670, a group of Shawnee migrated to the Savannah River area. Now, take this with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. But... There's got to be there's there's some truth in every lie. <laughs> the English based in Charlestown, South Carolina, were contacted by these Shawnee in 1674. They forged a long-lasting alliance. The Savannah River Shawnee were known to the Carolina English as Savannah Indians around the same time. The Shawnee groups migrated to Florida, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and other regions south and east of the Ohio country. Uh, and Shawnee went all the way down to Florida looks that way but see that's what I was saying before when they be coming up with these new confederations while it'll throw you because ain't nobody staying on one spot you couldn't have been up north called this moved west then they called you this came back south you being called this well it looks like originally based, based off of this history and again wouldn't get with your tribe because so you'll know when they started migrating because at first according to this again take it with a grain of salt they, they were semi-migratory and then at one particular time they were sedimentary meaning they didn't migrate at all mm -hmm. so they were forced to migrate when they came in contact with the um the Iroquois confederation so i don't know you tell me mm -hmm. um again like i said take it with a grain of salt do your research but um, to really get to the to to the meat and to the history of it, you're gonna have to 
we don't have to come come in contact with people that know their tribes, and then the tribes will actually have the migratory history to confirm or either debunk what we're seeing here. Mm-hmm. Um, it says. Um, Okay, in, in a writing in his journal in 1699, describes the Shawnee, or as he spells them, the Chowinans, the Chowinans as a single nation to fear being spread out over Carolina and Virginia in the direction of the Mississippi. Historian Alan Galley, Gall- Galley speculates that the Shawnee migrations of the middle of the late 17th century were probably driven by Beaver Wars, which began in 1640s. The nations of the Iroquois Confederacy invaded from the east to secure the Ohio Valley for hunting grounds. The Shawnee became known for their widespread settlements, extending from Pennsylvania to Illinois to Georgia. Among their known villages were Eskipa, Kitiki in Kentucky. Sonianto, also known as Lower Shawnee Town in Ohio. Chalakage, Chalakage, near what is now Sidicayuga, Alabama, or Chalakatha, at the site of the present day Chilliocothi, Ohio, Old Shawnee Town, Illinois, and Suwanee, Georgia. Man, they are testing me today with these words. <laughs> the language became a lingual franca for trade among numerous tribes. They became leaders among the tribes, initiating a sustaining pan-Indian residence to European and Euro-American expansion. What is pan-Indian resistance? Oops. I'm trying to find out what is a pan in here. Does anybody know? I don't like that pan word no. in front of stuff. Okay. So at this particular point in time, I want to want to go into the Beaver Wars. Mm-hmm. Because it says that they were probably they were um in the middle of the late 17th century they were probably driven by the Beaver Wars. Yeah, I know that was all about trade. So, what were the Beaver Wars? And I will put this in the back chat as well. Mm-hmm. Grab it and I'll post it for everyone. All right. All right. So the Beaver Wars. The Beaver Wars, also known as the Iroquois Wars or the French and Iroquois Wars encompass a series of conflicts fought intermittently during the 17th century in Eastern North America. During the 17th century, the Beaver Wars were battle for economic welfare through St. Lawrence River Valley in Canada and lower Great Lakes region. The wars were between the Iroquois trying to take control of the fur trade from the Hurons, the Northern Algonquins, and their French allies from medieval times. Uh, from medieval times, Europeans had obtained furs from Russia and Scandinavia. American pelts began coming on the market during the 16th century, decades before the French, English, and Dutch established permanent settlements you can pause for and one trading second. points on the continent after Basque fishermen chasing cod off Newfoundland's Grand Banks, battered with local Indians for beaver robes to help fend off the numbing Atlantic chill. By virtue of their location, these tribes wielded considerable influence in European Indian, considerably influence in European Indian relations with the early 17th century onwards. Hmm. So, what they're saying is, <laughs> 16th century, <laughs> these Indians were taking furs across the water, huh? Because I want to know, ain't nobody across the water no what they had to sell a trade don't nobody know what you got to sell a trade unless you tell them what you got right yeah and that's normally how stores work you go to the store and they tell you what they got or show you what they got to sell all right i'm mm-hmm. i'm just working on the timeline here that's it making sure i ain't losing it fur trade so we're talking about as early as a 16 as early as the 1600s 
there were that was established for a trade. Not just any fur trade, an established one at that. So this was so this this war, this beaver war was an economic war. Yeah. Like people always say that. Mm-hmm. Money, 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 money. No, 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 but um, earlier I was asking, does anybody know what pan Indian means? Yeah, I heard when you said it. I have no idea. That pan word kind of like pan. Never yeah, heard of it. Because like, <laughs> you know, the first time I ever heard of that was pan African, but we got pan Indian. Pan Indian. That's interesting to me. They got a Dare definition for up? it? Yeah, I think we gotta look that up. Yeah, bro. yeah, we gotta I gotta know what this. We means. can't, we can't let that slide, man. Mm-hmm. Not no pan Indian. I don't have to tell me something today. Every time we try to go vertical, we end up going <laughs> horizontal. Is <laughs> yeah, it like horizontal the way to go? That vertical gonna get you every time. Oh. Okay, so it's, Please it's basically it intertribal. I I see pan, in, intertribal. Um, intertribal and pan tribal are terms indicating an activity, organization, or event that extends across American Indian tribal boundaries. It's common to multiple tribes or involves the actions of more than one tribe. Hmm. So basically, what they saying pan Indian is. Indians making decisions that affect multiple Indians over a broad area. Right. And it crosses it crosses their boundaries. Now by it saying that Indian boundaries. wouldn't that be the same definition as for Pan African? I'm just saying this morning, relatives. If that's the definition of Pan Indian, wouldn't a Pan African had the same definition? You would just tie it to the African stuff that they're spreading. Wow, that's true. I never thought of it like that. All right, brain. Got to put my brain back to sleep. It's right. Okay, so 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 right quick. Let's look up Pan African. I'm like, mm 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 mm, ain't that done? <laughs> <laughs> you already <laughs> laughing, so I know it's that bad. <laughs> I ain't even see it. You laughing. <laughs> So, so when I type in Pan African in, in 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 Wikipedia, just like I typed in Pan Indian in Wikipedia, uh -huh. it gives me Pan Africanism. For okay. Pan African and Pan, and yes, and Pan Africanism is a worldwide movement that aims to encourage and strengthen bonds of solidarity between all indigenous and dysphoric ethnic groups of sub-Saharan African descent, based on a common faith going back to the Atlantic slave trade. The movement based extends beyond the continent of Africans with substantial support based among the African diaspora in the Caribbean, Latin America, the United States, and Canada. Hmm. So this is a whole movement off a of belief that melanated people came from Africa. Mm -hmm. But Pan-Indian is intertribal and it's indicating an, an activity, organizational event that extends across American Indian tribal boundaries. So why wouldn't it it's have common, the same definition for Pan-African? That, that's, that's what I'm scratching. Why does the definition change? I don't know. Let's see if there's a Pan-Asian. <laughs> why not? You know? Fine if they put some other people in the pan. Well, we always got to get a pan. What's up with the pan? Pan Asianism. Pan Asianism mm. is also known as Asianism or Greater Asianism. It is an ideology that promotes the unity of Asian people. Several theories and movements of Pan Asianism have been proposed, specifically from East, South, and Southeast Asia. Motivating the movement has been resistance to Western imperialism and colonialism, and the belief that Asian values should take precedence over European values. During the Cold War, the movement became less vigorous as nations in the region aligned with one, of one, with one or the other of superior powers. 
So you have Japanese, I mean, you have Pan-Asianism, you have African-Asianism, I mean, you have, you have Pan-Asianism, you have Pan-Africanism, and you have Pan-Indian. But, but only, yeah, but the only two of them have ism behind it. Yeah. And then it's kind of funny is that the Pan-Asian, it's an ide- a ideology, but the Pan-Africanism mm-hmm. must be a belief. No, Pan-Africanism is a worldwide movement. A movement, yeah. It's a worldwide <laughs> movement, but Pan-Asianism is just having love for, for, for who you are, combining, sticking together for a common cause. Right. It's an ideology that promotes the unity of Asian peoples. And, and they cause this, it's a, several theories and movements of Pan-Asianism have been proposed, specifically from East, South, and Southeast Asia. Yeah, that comes about. I'll let y'all marinate on that. That comes about because a lot of people don't know that Britain was over in China in the 16, 1700s. That's how long Britain had Hong Kong. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, Hong Kong always been British. Don't let that name fool you. <sighs> So what does the chat have to say about that? So we come across Pan Indian, which has which is a totally different meaning, understanding, and accepted definition of Pan Africanism, which there is no Pan African. Yeah, it's Pan Africanism. Yeah, there's no Pan African. Pan Africanism. Hmm. Just like there's no Pan Asian. There's Pan Asianism. So what does it mean when you put ism on the end of something? Oh, I forgot that. I forgot what ism mean. That's another definition by heart. I'm getting old, y'all. Ism. Shut. Shut the front door. Ism, a distinctive practice, system, or philosophy, typically a political ideology or artistic movement. That's ism. <laughs> Read it one more time. <laughs> one more time for uh, everybody. Ism, a distinctive practice, system, or philosophy, typically a political ideology or an artistic movement. Yeah. That's ism for you. Race, zism, Africanism. <laughs> Let me stop. <laughs> wow. Definitions. So Pan Indian means intertribal. Yep. Okay. I don't know. Uh, y'all <laughs> go ahead and do some research on that Pan African versus Pan Asian versus Pan Indian. Just something to think about. So let's go back to what we were saying. Oh, I got one for you. We forgot Pan American. Pan American. What does ahead, the Pan you... stand for in Pan American? Pan American, covering or American. representing all of America's both North America and South America, particularly with respect to events involving representative of most of all countries and Americas. Pan American, proper noun. Pan American, basically, the term Pan American is talking about everybody in North and South America. Pan. Doesn't that sound like Pan Indian? Yes, it does. It's kind of funny, but later on down the line, it changes. That's why I wanted to read the Pan American, because I remember Pan mm-hmm. is another way of saying spreading out. Pan, covering everything, to pan out, to cover all. Pan American, meaning it's covering all of North and South America. See, they be switching these definitions and words. I haven't been out that long, man. Hmm. I remember so that Pan American, Pan Indian, just like new, the new Americans... No, new Indian, old Indian, new American. Pan Indian is just basically talking about the term itself. Yeah, no, they old. They've been around, but it covers a Pan Indian covers all the Indians in a particular area that's affected by rules and laws. Pan American is everybody that's in North and South America is a Pan American. You're Pan in America. If you get that definition of Pan, Pan Not meaning really, the yeah. fan out, meaning the fan over. Like if you was in the military, Pan to the left, Pan to the right. 
Facts. I hear you. Well, one is talking about a people, and the other one is talking about a continent. Yep. Hmm. So, so why not? Why is African? Why is Pan African not talking about a continent? It's talking about a worldwide movement. Mm-hmm. And we all know about Pan, an ancient Greek religion and mythology. Pan, ancient Greek, is the god of wild mm-hmm. shepherds and flocks, nature, nature of mountain wilds, rustic music, and and protest and companion of the nymphs he has the hind quarter legs and horns of a goat in the same manner as a fawn well we know about that pan and here's nothing okay so what that, that, is it me again correct me if i'm wrong but is it me or did it sound like they're trying did they try to put, replace pangea with pan-african hmm. pan-african is the new pangea don't let them fool you. Pangea states that everything was connected together, meaning that everybody came from one thing and the land broke up and that's how we got separated. Pan-African states everything came from Africa and everybody migrated. It's the same theory. And I'm going to say the key word, theory, somebody educated guess. That has not been proven yet. It's just backed up by some... Can oh, somebody please tell me how long a theory get to remain a theory before it becomes untrue? I just don't know. <laughs> yeah, who holding on still? You know, because some of these theories been around since 15th, 16th century. So, where where is the cutoff to where theory, <laughs> if it's not proven, just That's get buried? Just my theory. That's just, <laughs> That's just my theory. <laughs> not proven yet. How many hundreds of years have some of these theories been around? And we ain't got nobody smart enough to say, okay, this is not this is not gonna work. I just want to just, I mean, because it struck me strange that they had Pan-Indian. I, mean, I had never heard the term, or seen the term Pan-Indian before, so I figured we would, um, you know, go and look up Pan-Indian. Yeah, Old Cliff said and, it right. They took Pan and turned it into a melting pot. Exactly. They got Which is the of, point. Mm-hmm. Big fact. What they call, what the they point call point America. What they call this? Ain't this the melting pot? They put everybody in the pan No they put everybody in the pan Spread everybody out in the pan And when you came out the pan Everybody was so mixed up you didn't know who was who Trap said he think we start pan Indianism. (laughs) (laughs) He said pan Indianism (laughs) Yeah he said he think we we was gonna start it We gonna start pan Indianism Trap don't do that bro Don't do that Don't do that bro Cause you know know, People people, people are looking for the base yeah, yeah. We're for the base, we'd be the Pan yeah, Indian versus the Pan African versus the Pan Aboriginals. No, nah, let's not do that. Man, do that. Listen, don't have us get no phone calls or emails. I don't want to be Pan. Why can't I be a crock pot? Yeah, I know, right? It's slow, <laughs> Stop. low and slow. Give me this low and slow. Take your time. Skillet. So now we know basically what happened to the the Shawnee. Mm-hmm. They were. It, it appears that they were dr- they were driven away by the um. The, the Iroquois Confederation. So let's 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 look at Domingo. We talked about Domingo Indian before, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. We can bring it back up because you know we probably have yeah. some new listeners that didn't hear about him. Yeah. <clears throat> so the Domingo. I'll go ahead and put that link in the back chat. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, post it. Yeah, all the links to the uh, stories and the sources are, are constantly being posted up in YouTube. So if you want them, uh, you can click on them and download them for yourself. So you can always have them in your collection to read and also and, and check for, out the source. And for those of you who are just now tuning in, we are at Lord Dunmore's War, which happened in 1774, two years before said Revolutionary, Revolutionary War. Yeah. Or, or the, the Declaration of um, Independence. Okay, so Mingo. The Mingo people are an Iroquois speaking group of Native Americans made up of peoples who migrated west to the Ohio country in the mid 18th century, primarily Seneca, Cayuga, Anglo America. Whoa, 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 whoa. Primarily Seneca and Cayuga, period. Anglo Americans call these migrants Mingos, a corruption of Mingo? Mingue. I'm just saying. <laughs> Mingo. 
<laughs> I know, right? A corruption of Mingui, Eastern Algonquin name for Iroquois language groups in general. Mingos have also been called Ohio Iroquois and Ohio Seneca. Most were forced to move to Indian territory in early 1830s under Indian removal program. At the turn of the 20th century, they lost control of communal lands when property was allocated to individual households in a government assimilation effort related to the Dawes Act and extinguished Indian claims to prepare for admission of Oklahoma as a state. In 1930s, Mingo descendants reorganized as a tribe and were re reorganized in 1937 by the federal government as the Seneca Cayuga tribe of Oklahoma. So the Dawes Act, <laughs> they, they just basically took these people's land and reallocated it to individuals, households, and government assimilation effort. Because remember, according to the Dawes Act, they actually were able to allocate land and also give my immigrants who pay five dollars per family member to get on this roll, and these family members that pay five dollars to get on these rolls were also given land. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah, uh, Trap. He says Gia is Mother Earth. So it says the etymology of the name Mingo derives from the Delaware word Mingue or Minki as transliterated from their Algonquin language meaning treacherous or stealthy. In the 17th century, the terms Minkua or Minkawa, Min, Minkwa were used interchangeably to refer to the Iroquois and the Susquehannock, both Iroquois speaking tribes. The Mingo were noted for having a bad reputation and were sometimes referred to as Blue Mingo or Black Mingo for their misdeeds, <laughs> like black sheep. <laughs> mm -hmm. The people who became known as Mingo migrated to the Ohio country in the mid uh, 18th century, part of a movement of various Native American tribes away from European pressure to a region that had been sparsely populated for decades, but controlled as a hunting ground by the Iroquois. The Mingo dialect that dominated the Ohio Valley from the late 17th to early 18th century is considered a variant most similar to this uh, Seneca language. So it seems like these Iroquois tribes were, were controlling the land because a lot of them seem to be involved in fur trade. So they would be tribes that would be more concerned with territory, mm -hmm. meaning who could hunt. And the reason why is because they wanted, they needed these furs. And they were, yeah, cause and they they were, were heavy. Also, they were heavily entrenched with the French, trading with the French with the furs and fabrics. I mean, when we read uh, before that the Iroquois were making deals, wiping out whole uh, tribes so they can just get the furs and resources to trade with the French. So that's who the Mingo were. And I put in the link is in the back chat so you can go do your own research and come back and provide some information that could be that could be helpful to everyone. Um, <laughs> so I'm I'm reading I'm I'm back under Lord Dumar's Dunmore's War. Mm -hmm. So it says the 1774 conflict between Colony of Virginia and and the Shawnee and Mingo American Indian nations. It says Governor of Virginia during the conflict was John Murray the Fourth, Earl of Dunmore. Lord Dunmore he asked, he he asked the Virginia House of Burgess to declare a state of war with a hostile Indian nations and order up an elite volunteer militia force for the campaign. Because remember, at this particular time, there was no army. Mm -hmm. So they had volunteer militia. The conflict resulted from escalating violence between British colonists, who, in accordance with previous treaties, were exploring and moving into land south of Ohio River, modern West Virginia, southwest of Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and American Indians who held treaty rights to hunt there. So when we talk about American Indians who held treaty rights, I would be guessing it would be the um, the Mingo and the Shawnee. Um, yeah, because that's what they're in that time. Exactly. As a result of successive attacks by Indian hunting war bands upon the settlers, war was declared to pacify the hostile Indian war bands. The war ended sooner after 
Virginia's victory in the Battle of Point Pleasant on October 10, 1774. So <laughs> it's, it seems like these Indians were attacking the settlers because the settlers was moving into their territory, their hunting grounds. Am I am I mis misreading it or is that what that, is that seems to be what's happening? That's what it sounds like to me. That they kept moving a little bit too far in, kept pushing, kept pushing. So Indians pushed back. So let's look at the Battle of Mount Pleasant, shall we? Excuse me, the Battle of Point Pleasant. Again, when we're doing this history, you just can't go north and south. You're gonna go. You're gonna go east and west a lot. Yes. The Battle of Point Pleasant. Pleasant, known as the Battle of Kanawha in some older accounts, was the only major action of Dunmore's War. What? Hold on, hold on. What, what was it was again? fought on October 10, 1774, primarily between Virginia militia and Indians from the Shawnee and Negro tribes along the Ohio River near modern Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Indians under Shawnee Chief Cornstalk attacked Virginia militia under Colonel Andrew Lewis hoping to halt Lewis's advance into the Ohio Valley. After a long and furious battle, Cornstalk retreated. After the battle, the Virginians, along with the second force led by Lord Dunmore, the rural governor of Virginia, marched into Ohio Valley and compelled Cornstalk to agree to a treaty in the war. So apparently this must have been a smaller tribe. Mm-hmm. But when you read the writing... Um, they so, wasn't so the preparations, it says Colonel Andrew Lewis in command of about 1,000 men was part of a planned two-pronged Virginia invasion of Ohio Valley. So he said when they talk about a two-pronged attack, they're talking about a point from two points. So it's not all 1,000 people attacking one spot. So you, you're probably looking at 500 attacking from one side and 500 attacking from another yeah. side, depending on the location or, or, the, or the space. Box or some man. derivative of, right. Yeah, box so as Lewis, as Lewis's forces made its way down the Kanawha River, guided by pioneer hunter trapper Matthew uh, Ar Arbuckle Sr., Lewis anticipated linking up with another force commanded by, by Lord Dunmore, Dunmore, who was marching west from Fort Pitt, when known as then known as Fort Dunmore. Dunmore's plan was to march into Ohio Valley and force the Indians to accept Ohio River boundary, which had been negotiated with the Iroquois in the, in the 1768 Treaty of Fort Stanwix. Where did this treaty come from? Huh. The Shawnees, however, had not been consulted in the treaty. So they, they feel like we felt right now. The Shawnees, however, had not been consulted in the treaty, and many were not willing to surrender. They're laying south of Ohio River without a fight. So this deal was made between the Iroquois Nation, and they didn't let the Shawnee know. Yeah, I got it right here. The Treaty of Fort Stanwix was a treaty between... Dusani and Great Britain signed in 1768 at Fort Stanwyck in present day Rome, New York. It was negotiated between Sir William Johnson, his deputy George Corhan, and representatives of the six nations, the Iroquois. The treaty established a line of property following the Ohio River that ceded the Kentucky portion of the colony of Virginia to the British as well as most of what is now West Virginia. The treaty also settled land claims between the Six Nations and the Penn family. The lands thereby acquired by the British in Pennsylvania were known as the New Purchase. So it's the treaty. The purpose of the conference was to adjust the boundary line between Indian lands and British col colonial sediments, set forth in the Royal Pro Proclamation of 1763. The British government hoped the new boundary line might bring an end to the rampant frontier violence which had become costly and troublesome. Indians hoped a new permanent line might hold back British colonial expansion. The final treaty was signed on November 5th with one signatory for each of the six nations and in the presence of representatives from the colonies of New Jersey, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, as well as Johnson, the Native American nations present received gifts and cash totaling $10,460 in today's time, uh, 70 pieces of silver, what's that, 3D sterling, the highest payment ever made from colonists to American Indians. The treaty established a line of property which extended the earlier proclamation line of the Algenius 
the divide between the Ohio and coastal watersheds, much further to the west. The line ran near Fort Pitt and followed the Ohio River as far as the Tennessee River, effectively ceding the Kentucky portion under the colony of Virginia to the British. As well as most of what is now West Virginia, the British had recently confirmed the land south of west of the Kiowa to the Cherokee by the Treaty of Hard Labor. Dang. During the Fort Stanwix proceedings, the British were astonished to learn that the Six Nations still maintained a normal claim over much of Kentucky, which they wanted to be added into the consideration. In addition, the Shawnee did not agree to this treaty, contesting colonial Virginian sediments between the Algenies and Ohio until the 1774 Treaty of Camp Charlotte. Basically, from reading this treaty, the Iroquois were going around here selling people land that they didn't have no rights to sell. That's what I was about to say. That's what I was thinking. Because it's like, you're hearing that these Shawnee and Mingo were getting pushed off their land. They kept having to migrate. So what's happened is the Six Nations are moving these people off the land. Well, actually, it sounds like they're signing these treaties as if it was their land. And then they basically just go ahead and move, move the Shawnees off. So they sell the land that don't belong to them. Mm-hmm. Try to hit it right on the head. Nothing new up under the sun. They making deals selling your homeland. Then these people ride in telling you, oh, well, this our land now. The Iroquois uh, sold this to us. You got to go take that up with them. And they're like, well, that's a treaty between you and them, and they ain't got nothing to do with us. Well, I don't want to so hear that. Move. You need to take that up with them. A lot of these wars would make sense. Now, then it would make sense why the Iroquois were always with the French and British riot and then jumping on other tribes. You running people off and getting paid. Man, they said these people didn't even know till these people showed up. It would explain why we were talking about some of the earlier tribes where how some of them had never seen these, these Europeans or these colonists. And they they like where these people come from? Mm-hmm. Yep. So, somebody let them in the somebody let them in the back door. Back door, and they open the front door and every window in the place. They doing the work for them. Six nations, six flags. Yep. Six that's flags. What, that's all right. Do the research on it. <laughs> Do the research on six flags. What is it called? Six flags of what? Don't nobody be paying American? attention? No, Six Flags of Atlantis. Oh, that's what it's called? Didn't know that. Mm-hmm. That's the full name of it. Wow. That's the entire name. Over time, they'll cut it down and people just say Six Flags. But look it up. The full original name of the park is Six Flags of Atlantis. So they're paying homage to the, to the Algonquins or the Six Nations that basically were bullying some of the other tribes. You've been living in Atlantis. I don't know why people keep looking for something out in the middle of the water. But let me hush. Story for another yeah, day. Shh, shh. Don't do that. <laughs> you talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> Stop snitching. Like, yeah, it gets deep. It gets deep. Oh, Cliff say we aren't willing to go to Africa. Should we be prepared for a repeat? Well, some of us are going willingly. I yeah. mean, this is, we are in 2019, uh, the movement to Ghana. There are people moving to Ghana now as we speak. Yeah, they said people already, in, uh, by what, it was the middle of last year? Mm-hmm. And so what? They said like a couple of, uh, what was it, 1,200 tickets already booked? Flights didn't even start. They just got their airline on top of this year. Thanks to the United States military. Mm-hmm. That's a long story. Yeah. And some of these relatives that want to be African and go so bad, hey, I ain't mad at you. I know why Tra- I'm not Tra- going. Bam says it's, what Trav says it's called allies. Yeah, if, you, if you look at it phonetically, it's Allah. But anyway. Mm-hmm. Allah. All lies. Yeah, they're only cool for a common cause. That's it. I mean, you can... 
it don't take a PhD or rocket science to see what's going on here. If the Iroquois and Algonquins are the first ones, which I'm starting to think Iroquois and Algonquins, they got ties in. You get what I'm saying? History mm -hmm. showing you that. For all we know, they can be the same people. I mean, let's keep it 100. You get what I'm saying? Um, if they had first contact, they the ones that got the, like we said before, the deepest relations with the colonizer. So by now, a lot of them done took on the ways of the colonizer. You got to think, we talk about a hundred years of these people living around each other and living with each other. You got to remember, with this is this is this is just Virginia colony. We're not mm -hmm. even talking about the, the at least a hundred year established history prior to that with with Europe, with the European, with other European countries. Yeah, um, like France and Spain. Mm -hmm. Remember, Virginia colony. The Virginia Britain came last out yep. of the three. Britain was last. Mm -hmm. Well, at this time it was England, or well, just became Britain. So they were last. To to oh. the peep you on to something, the name Iroquois itself. What language is that? Isn't that French? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So that means they would have to have dealings with the French, and the, that's the name that the French placed on them, right? That would stand the reason. Oh, okay. Just checking. So they could have been anybody else before the French got here. That's true. Oh, all right. I just wanted to check, you know, just throwing some stuff out there in the air. Get some sports. Well, no, they you. refer to them, yeah, because they refer to themselves as long houses. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody referred to them as long houses. Somebody, yeah. More than likely another tribe. Mm hmm. I don't know. It Nonetheless, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah, it looked like uh, whoever they originally was, they started on the conquest over here. And nonetheless, says the Sixth Nation Con Con Conference, the Great Law of the Longhouse are good references. Mm -hmm. Thanks, like, thanks nonetheless. And on Cliff says, I'm saying that we're the ones who are not willing to go. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, we, we yeah I ain't going. Yeah, we we not going. Hell no, we won't go. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Locked in. So let me let me read. Let's read about the colony of Virginia, shall mm -hmm. we? Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Because because that, that's the only that's the opposing side. Okay. Mm -hmm. Opposing side to our peoples. The colony of Virginia, chartered in 1606 and settled in 1607, was the first enduring English colony in North America. Like again, they're they're already they're basically 200 years behind. Following failed proprietary attempts at settlements of Newfoundland by Sir Humphrey Gilbert in 1583 and the subsequent further south of Roanoke Island, modern eastern North Carolina by Sir Walter Raleigh in the late 1580s. The founder of the new colony was the Virginia Company, with the first two settlements in Jamestown on the north bank of James River and Popham Colony on the Kennebec, Kennebec River in modern-day Maine, both in 1607. The Popham colony quickly fell due to, due to a famine, disease, and conflict with local Native American tribes in the first two years. See, this is this is this was our version of Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. We ain't helped them do nothing. Not only not only did we kick them when they was down, they starved. We didn't feed them, and then we killed them. Anyway, you know, Jamestown <laughs> occupied land belonging to the Powhatan Confederacy. And was also at the brink of failure before the arrival of a new group of settlers and suppliers by ship in 1610. Tobacco became Virginia's first profitable export, the production of which had a significant impact on society and settlement patterns. So, so let's so let's look at this. Tobacco became Virginia's first profitable export, the production of which had a significant impact on the society and settlement patterns. So. Let's go. We gotta go. We gotta go uh, horizontal again. Dumb, Jamestown dumb occupied land. They occupied land belonging to the Powhatan Confederacy. 
You can't occupy land unless you are allowed to. Mm-hmm. Considering the Powhatan Confederacy, remember who the Powhatan Confederacy are. Yep. These, these weren't a small tribe of Indians. The Powhatan people, sometimes Powhatan is also called Powhatan, are an indigenous group traditionally from Virginia. In some instances, the Powhatan may refer to one of the leaders of the people. This is most commonly the case in historical writings by the English. The Powhatans have also been known as Virginia Algonquins, Virginia Algonquins, as the Powhatan language is an Eastern Algonquin language, also known as Virginia Algonquin, or a dialect. It is estimated that there were about 14,000 to 21,000 Powhatan people in Eastern Virginia when the English colonized Jamestown in 1607. So think about this, they got here in 1606 and colonized in 1607. Mm-hmm. You got anywhere between fourteen thousand to twenty-one thousand Powhatan Indians. How many people can? How many people can a colony bring over at one time? What twenty? At this twenty. Think about it, them boats. Not as big as you want to think they are. Because you have to remember, you're gonna need a crew. You're not them. Them boats at this time, you're not bringing armies on. You're gonna need a seven-man crew just to control the boat. Then you're going to need fresh water and supplies to come across. Then even with them ships, they were so big at this time, they couldn't come in on land. So they're getting off of these on smaller rowboats. How many people on them? Four to five apiece? So that's why I always mm-hmm. say, so 10, 15 people came up on, on mainland and wiped out everybody. Man, they don't get out of here with that madness. So if someone could please show me how, how these Virginia colonizers could whoop up and enslave fourteen to twenty one thousand pounds of people in Eastern Virginia to sit on their land. I, I would love to see it. But moving on. In the late sixteenth and seventeenth centuries, Maman Tawik, a paramount chief named Wa Waun Seneca, created a, a powerful organization by affiliating thirty tributary peoples whose territory was much of Eastern Virginia. They called these were the Sinacama, Sinacama, Kamaka, densely inhabited land. Waun Sinaka came to be known by the English, English as the Powhatan chief. Each of the tribes within this organization had its own Wiroans, leader commander, but all paid tribute to the Powhatan chief. After Wawu Sinkar's death in 1618, hostilities with colonists escalated under the chiefdom of his brother Opanaka. Opana, Opanako. We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna get it right one day. Who sought in vain to drop off the encroaching English. His large scale attacks in 1622 and 1644 met strong reprisals by English resulting in the near elimination of the tribe by 1646. What is called the Powhatan Paramount Chiefdom by modern historians had been decimated. More important than the ongoing conflicts with the English settlements was the high rate of dust the Powhatan suffered due to new infectious diseases carried by North American, North America by Europeans such as the measles and smallpox. The Native Americans did not have an immunity to these which had been an epidemic in Europe and Asia for centuries. The wholesale deaths greatly weakened and, and hollowed up the Native American societies. It says, by the mid 17th century, the leaders of the colony were desperate for labor and developed the land. Almost half of English and European immigrants arrived as indentured servants and settlement continued. The colonists imported growing numbers of enslaved Africans for labor by 1700s. But then we did we also read that during this time period that they had more servants than slaves? Yep. Okay, just checking. The colonies had about 6,000 slaves, one-twelfth the population. It was common for black slaves to escape and join the surrounding politics. Some white servants were also noted to have joined the Indians. Africans and whites worked and lived together. Some natives also intermarried with them. After Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, the colony enslaved Indians were controlled. So, if so, <laughs> in what 1676, the colony, 1676, oh, okay. the colony mm-hmm. enslaved Indians were controlled. So that means 
they were working with the Indians before this point. Yep. In 1691, the House of Burgess abolished Indian slavery. However, many politicians were held in servitude well into the 18th century. In the 21st century, eight Indian tribes were officially recognized by Virginia and having ancestral ties to the Politic Confederation. The Pamunkey, the Monopony, are the only two peoples who have retained reservation lands from the 17th century. The competing cultures of the Powhatan and English settlers were united through unions and marriages of members, the most well known of which was Pocahontas and John Rolfe. Their son, Thomas Rolfe, was the ancestor of many Virginians. Many of the first families of Virginia have both English and Virginia Algonquin ancestors. That's how that's how a lot of this land was was acquired. Some survivors of the Powhatan Confederacy have relocated elsewhere beginning in the late 19th century. Individual people identified collectively as the Powhatan Renape Nation settled in a tiny subdivision known as Mooresville or Delaire in Pensacon Township, New Jersey. Their ancestry is mostly from the Rappahannock tribe of Virginia and the related Nanticoke tribe of Delaware. They have been recognized as a tribe by the by the state of New Jersey. So, <clears throat> questions, comments, criticisms? <laughs> so again, these people were let, these, this, the Virginia colonies were let onto this, this, um, this land. Because I said it was occupied. It was occupied by the Powhatan, belonging to occupied and a land belonging to Powhatan Confederacy. It didn't say they took it from the Powhatan Confederacy. So they were in on this. Now, unless somebody can show me how, like um, Bone said, someone came on land four or five at a time, and they were able to enslave over 14,000 to 21,000 people. They just gave up their land and just surrendered and became indigenous servants. Anybody? Anybody? No? Oh, okay. So that was basically Lord Dunmore's War, Colony of Virginia, Shawnee versus Domingo. And what it appears to me, and that's why we put the links in the back chat, I mean, in the links in the chat, so y'all can do your own research and come up with information that can either support or give us more clarity on what happened. And then for those of you who are tied into your tribes, if you are tied to any of these tribes, maybe they have some information that could, that could help solidify or clarify the information that has been brought out. But it appears to me that the Shawnee and the Mingo were sold out by the Six Nations or the Iroquois Confederacy because mm -hmm. there was a treaty signed between them and the colony of Virginia. And then these settlers started coming on these these Mingo and Shawnee land, and they're like, yo, what y'all doing? Well, we got a treaty with, <laughs> we got a treaty with Six Nations. <laughs> they record Confederates, y'all got to move. That mentality is, this has nothing to do with us, and this is our land. Y'all treaty is with them. They stuff don't belong over here. So then, they called in the muscle. They record Confederacy. They made them leave. Does anybody see anything different? I mean, there's three sides of every story. See, the thing is, too, this might be throwing it out there a little bit or a little too stretched because my brain just just processing everything. And I remember the stories that we read uh, last week about certain tribes that intermarried within other tribes and the colonists for so long that you couldn't tell them apart and didn't know you wouldn't know who was who anymore, right? Basically, at this time, the Iroquois, the only people they really can be mingling with is who? The, right, the, um, the European, they're, they're, right? They're, right, they're, they're allies. They're allies. Well, they're allies of. Yeah, because outside of that, 
everybody don't nobody trust them no more you got to think this, this is that deal that made it to the point where ain't nobody trust them point blank after this so now if they in power they cool think about it they're cool with the british they're cool with the french they're trading back and forth intermarrying interbreeding how would we know what these people look like in 2019? I'm just throwing that out there. I don't think we would know, like you said, because they've had they've had a couple of they've had a couple of generations, at least three. We know after the uh, what was it, Civil War, you don't hear the name Iroquois no more. We know they just didn't die off. I think they became citizens and started started working with the Virginia the Virginia colony or the thirteen colonies to start acquiring and accumulating land because they spoke uh, they spoke the dialect of Algonquin, which could communicate with a lot of other tribes. It was easy it was easy for them to start commandeering, and it's not to me it sounds like they was doing what 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 Rome was doing. Mm-hmm. Coming in, taking over, intermarrying, and then going over and conquered a conquer the next bit of land but i could be wrong yeah and the reason why i throw that out there because i'm like hold on if the u.s constitution is a copy of the iroquois constitution right i don't care what you copy i can copy your test all day long it ain't going to help me apply it any better is it i'm gonna still need no. somebody that's familiar with that original system i'm gonna need parts and places or this mechanism to make it work until your own can learn at a pace over a time right it's just like if you buying a company you buying a brand new company you might fire the small end workers that you can easily replace but the high-end management you ain't getting rid of them on day one until you get them to train and teach your new people to come in correct that's correct because when when companies are sold they maintain the CEO because he and his executive assistants or her executive assistants know how the company operates and until they can get a good feel for how it runs until they can, can, can train and turn over the company they stay on board in the consulting form so is, you're right isn't the US a corporation with CEOs and chairmen I'm, I'm just yep. saying mm-hmm. mm, mm, mm. I just find it hard to believe that you can come to a land to where you got particular nations that's entrenched in certain places. You never hear about these people being wiped out. You never hear about them going to war. Because the further and further that we come up in history, we realize they're allies. And there's never no time after that to where you read in history where they split. They just, you don't hear about them no more. And I know there's no way that these foreigners, I don't care what they read, what they seen, they couldn't uh, put this government here, the application of it, without the original people that was running it before. Somebody had to teach them, help them, show them. That's right, because um, when they got here to the United States, they didn't know what tobacco was, so somebody had to teach them how to grow it, plant it, harvest it, and eventually trade it. So. Now, see, y'all got to remember, we're talking 15, 1600s. See, the part of this story that, that, that we must not forget, you had the French messing around with the so-called Iroquois 1400, you get what I'm saying? That these people were already dealing with each other before the 15th and 1600s even got here. Mm-hmm. And Doodle Vision says they look like Northerns too. I wouldn't doubt it. Because you mm -hmm. figure by this time, they are probably looking more like uh, maybe 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 a shade and a half darker than our um, than our Native American tribes now. Yeah, at this time, at this time, you would think they would be start getting to that here yeah, that tannish type in between.
by this time because we know this true because their stories are documented to where there's whole tribes on the west coast that ain't nothing but mulatto from top to bottom and we talking about in the 1700s this was uh this is documented yeah, and, uh, and and Pamela Hall, shout out to Pamela Hall for the um the bill she did with us, and for allowing us to be our, our first spotlight on the Tonsils Assembly. Mm -hmm. She was talking about um finding Europeans in her family, mm -hmm. and how that has affected you know, um, you know her family ties and how it has um in some cases divided the family. So it's it's ha it has happened. Yes. So it's not something that's it's not something that's written in a book. It's something that people are starting to discover when they do the genealogy which is the reason why genealogy is important and because what you'll find is that even though this 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 point of view from wikipedia is one-sided it has some truth to it now you might not like it mm -hmm. but the only way to get to the total scope of the truth is to tie into your tribe and find out what they have to say mm -hmm. because outside of that you won't know you won't be able to formulate the whole story just going off of what somebody wrote mm -hmm. that's the reason why we put this in the, the chat so you can take a look at it digest it tear it apart come back with information you know hopefully tie into what you've already done as far as genealogy and and, and show some validity mm -hmm. because without talking to the tribe and without getting that information those facts with the tribe you're just guessing and speculating and that's what like the saying come stuff in. like yeah saying stuff like Cherokee were all white well, unless you talk to us some, some Cherokee chiefs how would you know they were all white mm -hmm. unless you were part of the Cherokee nation how would you know they was all white mm -hmm. that's I'm speculation saying. so that's the reason why we encourage everyone out there to, to tie into your tribes look at this look at this information that's being presented because we gotta get it right mm hmm check the emotions at the door it has to be no matter what it is no matter what it is that we unturn no matter how ugly it may appear we face it together and we just get through it like I said and like TMA and I've been saying and like we say from this platform that a lot of this is about accepting the wrongs of our ancestors no we're not taking the blame off of nobody no we're not saying that <laughs> They didn't have a hand in it. Well, we're saying for once, for once, let's stop blaming and let's take care of the parts that we had to do with it. Let's fix the wrongs that we had to do because we see that without tribes selling out other tribes, this could never happen. That's and, facts. and wasn't nobody forcing these tribes back in the four, 13, 1400s to mingle? Show me the pistol from the 1300s. I'll wait. These people were comfortable. These people do the same thing that people do now. Yes, some people want to stick around their own. Some people are mingle. Some people want to go out. Be around different people. It's the same thing. Life as you know it has always been. And just like now in our lifetime, we are responsible for a lot of the damages that's done to our people. Same as it was then, same as it is now. We just got to stop pointing the finger and start taking responsibility for our own actions and start fixing it. at the end of the day by no stretch of the imagination are we <laughs> taking blame for something that we didn't do but we have to be able to take blame for what we did do because if we truly believe that we are some of the most powerful people on the planet and we are the first in everything that's positive why is it so difficult to fathom that we're the first in something negative because as great as, as, great as everybody believes that we are and as great as we believe that we are why is it so hard to fathom that we were the first traders? Why is it hard to believe? Anything we put our minds to, we own it. And when I say we own it, we run it. Mm -hmm. No one's better than us. 
But when it comes to being bad, oh, that's something that that never could have happened to us. And I'm not saying that every tribe was in on it. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is you can't come on somebody's land <laughs> and take it without help, some help. Permission. Come on, you gotta we have, have to, help. Facts. We gotta think this out. And if you believe it can happen, then that means you believe somebody can walk in your house and take your house from you. I mean, physically walk in your house and take your house from you. Think about it. The police can't walk in your house and put you out your house unless they got the permission of the deed holder, right? That's facts. Even if you renting something. And somebody don't like you being in there paying rent there. They can't do nothing about that unless the owner of the property has something to say. So come on, man. Let's stop trying to paint this this this, this little fairy tale to where we so innocent. Oh, why us? It was us doing it. They just followed suit. Both sides is just as guilty. But let's stop worrying about them. And let's get back to mine and ours. I right, keep saying we worried about sweeping in front of the European, the French, and the Spanish porch. But our own house is dirty. We got traders in our own house. I think that's one of the biggest problems that we as a people face. We are under the impression that our tribes all got along. It was kumbaya and there were no disagreements, disagreements, which is not true. If you, and I see, here's the thing, here's my theory, and this is a theory. My theory is that the reason why many people do not want to tie into their tribes is because they don't want to know the truth. Mm -hmm. So they would rather create their own tribes and manifest their own truth. Because if they, if they tie into their tribes, they may find something that they don't like. Like there are a lot of non melanated people in their tribe. Which doesn't fit with their narrative. Again, I'm just speculating. Mm -hmm. So it would make more sense to find my own tribe as opposed to tying to a tribe and do some that already real work. exists. And do some real work for some real change. But again, like I asked, if you are going to start your own tribe and put and purchase some land and put it in a trust, can you please tell me how you will reconcile being on somebody's land when their family comes back and can prove and show the deed of the land that you bought that was stolen because you bought it from a realtor company, or either a commercial or residential company, and then put this private land into a public trust and then build your nation on it. You actually think that you'll be able to keep that land if it's proven to belong to another tribe, which it, which you will be proven to belong to another tribe. Because if you believe that we were here before colonizers, that means all this land belonged to somebody before the colonizers got here. And that means that that land that you purchased does not belong to you and you did not tie it back to your tribe. That means it belonged to somebody else's tribe. And if it belonged to somebody else's tribe, how long are you going to think you're going to get to keep it by starting your own tribe and then putting that land into a trust? I'll wait. I've not yet heard anybody reconcile that. I'll be here until you do. Because that, that don't mean it can't be. Now, the, the, don't get me wrong. I just want to know how you're going to reconcile it. I'm not saying it can't be reconciled because I don't know everything. But what I know is this. You got some land that wasn't originally in your family or that originally didn't belong to you and when it does get claimed how is that going to be resolved no one has answered that question yet I'm going to tell them like this TMH before I say this what I'm going to say these are not the views of a Tontinous Assembly these are not the views of CAB these are my, this is my personal stance on this you spineless gutless cowards that's what you are you rather run with your tail between your legs try to start something brand new then man up or woman up 
and fight for the tribes that have been being slaughtered for all these years? You are the cowards. You are the traitors. And I'm going to give it to you 100. That's our biggest problem. We're supposed to be so prideful, so much of a warrior. Where? Because if we warriors, we stand up and we fight for those of our people that's being done now. There's over 500 some tribes on this land. Over 300 of some of them are melanated. And we trying to call ourselves self-proclaimed chiefs? It needs to get ugly because they're cowards. They're the distraction. And it need to be called out. You ain't here to do nothing but get in the way of progress. Because real work is going out here. Finding these tribes that look like us and seeing what we can do. How you gonna stand and say you love your people? Then you gonna run off and start your own thing. And most people wanna do it because they want control. Let's keep it 100. They got the ego they need to get stroked. Because if it's really about the people, if it's really about love for thyself, then you do your genealogy. You find your tribe. You even go as further as working with other tribes outside of your tribe. If you know they need the help. You don't got to be my tribesman for me to help you. We need to start calling this mess out when we hear it and when we see it. We need to start making people accountable for their actions. Because if we keep turning the other cheek, guess what? We're just as guilty of the foolishness too. Start calling it out on sight. There was a time in our history. We ain't let none of this BS fly. If you was fake and phony, you got ran off the block. We fell off code. We let our own come in our neighborhood, our own come in our neighborhoods and take from us. And we keep giving them passes. We got to stop. I don't care if you look like me. If you can't hold up to your responsibility, then you can't be next to me. We must get back to this value. If something ain't right, it ain't right. We got to stop letting it, letting the whole world think we cool with a handful of us do. No. At the end of the day, I will say this. And I'm going to continue to say this. And I'll wait for, 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 for proof and a response to say otherwise. Our tribes have a constitution and they have bylaws and they have a council. So for anybody out there that's claiming a tribe, I want to see your constitution. I want to see your bylaws. I want to see your counsel. Who made you chief? And as Dudu, as, as Dudu Vision always says, in order for you to be a chief, you either got elected or somebody died. Facts. In many cases, you got elected because somebody died. Facts. If you were chief, then you should have been elected based off of what our ancestors did. Peer point blank in discussion. If you were chief, you should have been elected based off of what our ancestors did. Grand Rising, I see we got Sir Dudu Vision in the building himself. If you are part of a tribe right now and you are not helping other people in tribe, help people find their tribes, the question I ask you is why not? I can't tell you why you do stuff. I can only ask why you're not doing stuff because only you know that. 
if you're part of a tribe and you are co-signing on people starting their own nation, the question I have to ask you is why? The, the more important question I would ask you is, does your chief and your council sign off on that happening? My what next, do they say about that? My next Go ahead. Is this. If you're part of a tribe, why you ain't helping your brothers and sisters get part of a tribe? See, that, 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 that oh, let me hush. Whew. You got it. I got to calm down. I mean, this is real. I mean, it, this is this is a time where there's no time for games. It's time to put up or shut up. Exactly. And at the end of the day, a line has been drawn. And for so long, we have been acquiescent by silence, by not speaking, by not saying anything. Again, I don't know why people don't do something, why people don't say something. I can't control it, but I can't I can't control what I ask. Mm -hmm. And I can't say this. Bring your proof. If you part of a tribe, let me see your bylaws. Let me see your constitution. Let me see the council. That's public information, whether mm -hmm. you are registered or not. Or not. And the main if you reason, are part of go ahead, sorry, go ahead, Bob. No, no, go ahead. And the main reason we banging on it because it has to stop. These are the these are the things that's leading too many of our people astray. And I love my people too much to sit up on this platform to watch it. It's not finna go down. Because for too long, it's our own people that's holding us down. The ones that look just like you, saying that they love you. Giving you this false information. Giving you this these directions that's never going to help you. And the majority of us know it's BS. But we still go along like it's cool. So what example are we setting? What example are we setting? By now, the focus should be on solution, resources, helping those of our own tie back into their tribes. It should be all hands on deck. I don't care where you are. You don't have to be a part of A2. Starting your community. Or what, we're going to sit down, let time pass by, or what we could have did, what we should have did, or I wish. Let's don't sit up here and act like we so great and we come from this prideful grateful warrior stock and shaking in our boots right now when it's time for action and action not even getting physical to fight the action is just standing up putting yourself on notice that you're not going to accept the bs anymore from yourself or anyone else are y'all just waiting to hold hands to sing kumbaya Uh, I wonder how that's going to work. They can have that. And I don't mean to rant or anything or even call it a rant. It's just it has to stop. Somebody got to be willing to say it. Somebody got to be willing to start calling this out. It, it has to stop. Wrong is wrong. And if you sit back and you watch somebody mislead your people down the wrong path, you're the worst of the worst. Because you know better. This whole Indian list of these wars, if you're missing the whole part that the majority of this, is Indians turning on Indians 
if that's not registering like hold up hold up hold up hold up this can never go down if we wasn't going through this bs amongst each other i don't have to like you i don't have to live around you but at least respect you you get what i'm saying get back to that level of respect so i don't have to like nothing that you do but just enough to respect you as a living human being okay you over there i'm over there and i'm talking to the indians we got to get on code first with ourselves and each other again he says when all first things are first all second things follow and we got to correct our own house first we have to be willing to accept and admit that we have we we have a hand in this and we and we still have a hand, we still doing the same thing to this day i mean it is what it is i mean like i said i'm still waiting for somebody to ask these questions mm-hmm. with, with facts not speculation with facts because at the end of the day if you are truly a tribe and if you are truly a chief if you are a chief do me a favor show me your bylaws that's it show me your council that's your it. council elects a chief can you or 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 show me the tribe that you belong to where chiefs were self-appointed because there may be a chief that was self-appointed and if that's the case and that's the tribe you belong to obviously you, you come from that line so obviously you can show it. Mm-hmm. There are over five hundred some odd tribes. I'm sure maybe there is a tribe that has a self-appointed chief that doesn't have a council that doesn't have bylaws and that doesn't do the voting. I'm sure there is. I just don't know of any, but that don't mean they don't exist. Mm-hmm. So if you are part of that tribe, you should be able to, you should be able to show it, because we already know for a fact that not all tribal history was oral. It was also mm-hmm. written. Written. There's a lot. There's a lot more written history than people care to think. So, I mean, this is not to try to embarrass anybody or to no. discourage anybody, dissuade anybody. No. I'm talking about people who are proclaiming themselves to be chiefs of tribes. I'm not talking about a. a a name that you got from YouTube. I'm yeah, talking about yeah. people that are proclaiming themselves to be chiefs. I mean, if you achieve, that's cool. If you achieve, then you should be able to show and prove that you achieve. Yeah, I hear leading our people down a dangerous path, claiming to be something, claiming, for, oh man, it's just sickening. And if you have some information where being a sovereign nation, the way that you say it's going to work, um, pictures and videos of you being in court, or those people being in the court and winning, that would be a nice help. Some documentation that proves that, that would be some help. And if you say that you don't have, why do you have to show proof? Then I would I would challenge you to say, if you got your YouTube channel and you got your phone and you didn't show proof, then show everybody how you did it. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's fair. That's because you saying. can't, right? Because you can't be saying you don't need to show proof in one vein, but then in your everyday life, you got to show proof. Mm-hmm. Look at the damages. Yeah. I'm just tired of seeing the damages of our relatives that that keep going for this and falling for this, and that's why I even ask of them question everything. If it sounds too good to be true, <laughs> it is. Question everything. There's no get rich scheme. There's nothing that's going to get you out of this in a snap or a blink of an eye. It's going to take work. It's going to take dedication. It's gonna be interesting to see how this next week pans out. Tent pan. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that word again. Mm-mm-mm. Again, at the end of the day, we we gotta we gotta clean house. We, I gotta know. I gotta know. <laughs> I gotta know who I'm dealing with, 
And if your chief signs off when you, you know, supporting sovereign sovereign nations and creating your own tribe, then More they should have you. it in writing. Mm -hmm. They should have it in writing because I don't know any tribes that don't vote without it being in writing. Mm -hmm. So if your tribe and your council has signed off when you're doing it, then you should be able to produce the results. If not, why not? And because I don't, because I don't have to, and not because I shouldn't, that's not an answer. That's an excuse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you and, and if you want to, and if you're asking me why do I say that, and why I'm asking, because I don't know of any chiefs. I know my chief wouldn't sign off on it. Bingo. The council wouldn't sign off on it either. And I don't know any other chiefs or council that would sign off on it. And if I'm wrong. Hey, like I said, I'll be the first to apologize in public. You know, okay. all it takes, all it takes is all it takes is a is a is a is a, is a document with a signature on it, with the signees of the council, and with the final like signature this. of the chief saying that this is okay and we we co-sign on it and, and, and it's okay and we don't have a problem with it. That's all it would take. That's all it would take. Mm -hmm. But I, I doubt it's gonna happen. But I could be wrong. When yeah. was the last time? It won't be the first time I was wrong. You know, not like uh. Mistakes don't happen, but that's all we saying. Because that's leading a lot of it's hurting a lot of people. A lot of our people are getting sucked in behind that. And as and we have to take more responsibility on the individual side to like I said not too long ago, stop looking for the fast fix, get rich quick scheme. And be willing to do the work. Be willing to tie in. Be willing to start in your community. Be willing to help build your community in your neighborhood. We must be willing to start on the individual level, then the local level, then we move up. You can't you can't aim for the head. Sometimes you have to bring the head down to you. So we gotta work our way up. A lot of people are just coming into the knowledge of self. So you just don't want to throw them out there to the wolves like that. No, we got to get this right. Tomorrow not guaranteed to no one. We must get this right. And for those of you who are doing the work in the community and who are reaching out and helping people, we like to hear from you. We like to, to spotlight you. Or if you know someone that is doing that, let us know so we can spotlight them because what we want to do is we want to encourage that because at the end of the day, if if we're talking about being a tribe and we're talking about supporting your community, we should have proof, shouldn't we? We should have some examples of helping the community, shouldn't we? It shouldn't be something that I'm just saying and I'm not doing. Mm -hmm. You should be able to see some proof, right? I mean, I think all cell phones have cameras and their their recording devices where you can actually speak to the person out there yes sir so the question that i'm going to ask for everybody that's on this platform that's listening is start asking the people who are who are promoting indigenous autonomous american indian native american ask them what are they doing what are they doing in their communities it doesn't have to be a facetious question it could be a question out of genuine concern because yeah. you might be able to help because you they might be in your city we we are a lot better together working together than we are working separately mm -hmm. so if they have something going on it needs to be promoted it needs to be talked about and if, and if they are not working in the community wouldn't you want to know why not mm -hmm. I mean I know I would All right, hold up what's really going on and that's and that's all we're saying again. If there's you know people in the community that's doing the work, yeah, give us give us a link. We'd be proud to uh put it out there to let the world know. Because who else is gonna set this blueprint? Who else is gonna do the work to let the youth of the mall know it can be done and how? What we do today, what we document today, what we do on these platforms is forever. 
You understand? These are the markers that we build and put together. So our children's children, 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 if they ever needed to look back and document history to learn anything, we already have it there for them. Let's not let's stop waiting for the drastic disaster to happen to make a move. Let's start putting the work in now. Let's stop playing checkers because this is chess. Let's start thinking 10, 12, 13 moves ahead instead of one at a time. Let's start being more rational in our process and less emotional in our thinking. So again, if you are active in your community and you are working to help people do their genealogy or you you've been doing your genealogy and you want to share your story because, you know, I think it's a story that needs to be shared. Then we would love to hear from you. We would love to um, record it and then share with everybody else. So that would encourage them. Um, or if you know somebody who has a story that's dealing with their genealogy and what they're doing in the community to help their community, please let us know. Of course, get their permission. Mm -hmm. um, to the end of the day, you are a lot more effective dealing with your own community than you will ever be on YouTube or any social media platform. Facts. Um, that's pretty much it. You know, get back to your get back to your family tree, do your genealogy, tie into your tribe. Mm -hmm. Once you find your tribe, let us know. And we'll help your tribe. Facts. Peace, peace, David. Peace, no clip tiff. Anybody else that's in the chat? Mm -hmm. And with that, I relinquish the mic. Um, I guess getting down to the closing. Any words from uh, no sellout or uh, doodle vision?